Good morning, Tech Central. Good morning, Cypherwave. Hello, Wayne. And hello, Casper. Guys, my IT guy says that you mustn't trust me. He also says that I mustn't trust you. And I'm honored to have you on today's podcast with Tech Central to chat to Cypherwave, Wayne Desar, and Casper DeVault to understand a bit more about zero trust. And let's kick off there. Let's just start with what does zero trust actually mean? James, thanks for having us on the show, and it's great to chat to you. I think the topic of zero trust is quite an interesting one. And just by introduction of you mentioning, you know, what we're going to be talking about in terms of, you know, trust from an IT department perspective. But where zero trust has actually come from, we really need to take a step back in understanding what the hype is around it. Over the last few years, we've all seen and come across articles or would have heard stories of data breaches. We're all very much familiar about ransomware and how prevalent it's become within businesses. And I don't think that there's a day that doesn't go by where we see a news article that talks about a breach that's happened, you know, whether it's globally. I think most notably, you would have heard of a lot of local breaches. And it doesn't seem to be a scenario where it's a specific companies, so where you would say it's small companies. It's happening to companies of all sizes and shapes and across all industries. So the principle of zero trust really just looks at IT security and IT policy management in the greater context of mitigating business risk from an IT perspective and an IT security perspective. Okay, thanks, Wayne. And as the CEO of CypherWave, it's a privilege to have you on the call today because I think that your understanding and your positioning of CypherWave and zero trust in the market is absolutely critical. And Casper, your involvement is as a chief cloud officer for CypherWave. And today's conversation, quite specifically, is going to be talking about some practical examples and some scenarios. So let's maybe jump straight into some of those and un- unpack what Wayne's just explained about zero trust. Yes, definitely, James. So for my side, where I come into play is I obviously work directly with our customers and most of them still being on the traditional setup of having a file, having a service in the cloud or having a service on site and having some antivirus on there and building a public cloud or private cloud that has got a philosophy of zero trust behind it. So utilizing Nutanix, which allows us to do micro-segmentation, visualizations of the connections between the servers, so simplifying it, which is normally the most difficult thing about Zero Trust is implementing it because you need to know what your data is, what your applications are doing at any given time in order to lock them down. And we've invested into technology that allows us to help our customers simplify that to fast track a deployment of Zero Trust. Okay, thanks, Casper. What I'm definitely hearing you say is it's not just about humans not trusting each other. It's about humans not putting trust in the system that is perhaps a network, an access, a device, other implications of, for instance, a data breach that might happen. And therefore, that trust needs to be what? A firewall? Well, you know, James, not necessarily a device, because I think what's Mm. important to understand is when we're talking about zero trust is how do we get to this point? Where did this buzzword or catchphrase come from? And I maybe want to take us a step back saying, you know, when you look at it in a traditional business, you have a traditional security approach. And what that is, is a company wants to protect their office network. So they would put a firewall down, right? Yes. And you want to protect your company email. So you'll put an email security solution in to do that. You know, companies may want to protect their data by putting backups in place. And then, of course, when you think about it, you've got end users inside of your business and they're using company devices and you want to lock those down. And so you put some endpoint security on it. This is what we, you know, at Software, we call the traditional security approach. And of course, businesses today should not be operating without those four areas at least covered from a security perspective. So now that you have the traditional security measures in place, your appliances and your software and your backups, the question really comes in around how trusting are you that your firewalls are up to date, the policies are constantly being reviewed and evaluated, your backups are in place, you know, how secure are those backups? Not a lot of customers really look at 
what type of protection their backup software offers them. So ransomware is really grown quite significantly. And if you don't have a backup software that actually has the ability to protect against ransomware, then all you're doing is, you know, you're backing up already compromised data. That's and then from point. a new perspective, when you look at it, is mm-hmm. you may have software antivirus software to be able to make sure the device itself is running the latest software patches. However, it's a question about how protected is the company data on that device. And here introduces a policy framework of zero trust. It's really just questioning all of the enablement components and really wanting to understand whether they are being maintained. Because I think traditionally as businesses, Our approach to security is one that we trust that all of those devices and those appliances are doing what they're supposed to. But, you know, we've seen in a real life scenario and many because we provide customers with services of how without having constant evaluation and asking the questions, it could lead to a compromise. And that's really what we want to highlight and elevate in what we're looking at is a model of a zero trust security model being implemented by companies to really mitigate their business risk. Okay, brilliant. And by mitigating, you're actually saving the rework and the hassle as a result of being a breach. Now, that verification process is obviously critical. And maybe there's some examples, and I love to hear case studies and maybe let's not drag anyone's reputation through it, but I know that you've got some examples you perhaps wanted to talk about, but What are those scenarios and what do they look like? And why is that verification of everyone and every device and all data points so important? Yeah, I mean, I think Casper can talk us through practical scenarios where we've assisted a number of our customers. So, you know, whether the backup policy framework wasn't implemented correctly or whether the security framework wasn't implemented correctly. And Cass, maybe you can take James through what the implications are for businesses through the experiences that we've picked up. Yes, definitely. Please. So what we've encountered is, I mean, it all starts with the end user at the end of the day. That's where pretty much everything starts. So you could have everything in place. You could have backups. You could have every single thing you could possibly do. But you're still trusting, let's say, your corporate network as an example. You know, an employee comes to work. As soon as he's on your network, you're trusting him. You're trusting that everything else will just work, which you can't do. And ransomware opens the wrong file encrypts all the production environment because it spreads like a fire. So as soon as one device is infected, that's what it's designed to do. It spreads. And then, you know, you start getting reliant on your cloud providers for your offsite backups, et cetera, to recover. But that's still a reactive approach. But the examples we've had is where customers literally lost everything. It encrypted every single thing, including their backups on site. It encrypted that as well. Because, I mean... It's actually designed to go after your backups first Mm. because it knows that's what you're going to use to mitigate it. And that's traditionally where we would come in and at least have off-site immutable backups for you so that we could give you your data back. But the whole approach of the zero trust is to not even get to that position Mm -hmm. to make sure the customers never get there. Okay, that's a scary analogy, the idea of someone actually hacking your backup. And what I'm understanding a lot more right now around security is that often that security starts and that breach happens at home as a result of, for instance, and perhaps this is the largest cause of internal fault, is user distractibility. Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at it and we really need to be cognizant of where the loopholes are. So James, 100% to your point, when you're talking about a compromised employee device that's been worked on from home because that's the reality of the world we're living in right now. You know, we have employees working not only from the office, they're working from home and working from everywhere else. And this is where, when you look at that practical example, the question is, how do you take a zero trust security model and adapt it to that scenario? And in that instance, it would just look at how do you lock down or further protect that company device that that employee is using. So it would be questioning around things like are USB ports, you know, locked down outside of the office environment or even in the office environment Mm -hmm. to minimize the ability for somebody to export data 
if it isn't a requirement for them to be able to do that. A question further around that would be to look at things like virus updates when devices are outside of the office network and putting policy framework in place that has a remote push where it's mandatory for the employee's device to update at a certain point in time. Because what we've seen is typically as end users, we get very distracted and there's never a convenient time to update security framework policy. There really isn't because it's disruptive to what I'm doing. But when these things become mandatory because you're trying to mitigate risk, then you're less dependent on the user to be able to accept when that needs to happen And it's more so ingrained in the policy of a device or a process of how you're working. Absolutely, because human error is inevitable. So let's try and mitigate that first off. I think that's a great way to start introducing this concept of zero trust. And not that it's a new concept, but it's a term that's perhaps somewhat countercultural. We want to trust people. We want to trust our devices. We want to trust our employees, our clients, the end user. But what are some of the benefits that you've seen the direct benefits to organizations where they have put in the correct policy. You've guided them to that process. You've put in the correct platforms and procedures. You've made sure that their softwares and the platforms are up to date and managed properly. What are some of those key benefits that people are seeing and reporting back to you on? So I'm going to go first, if that's okay, Casper, yeah. because I think from a business perspective, it's really simple. Peace of mind. And I think okay. that's what every business executive wants. Or business owner, you want the peace of mind that your data is secure. You want the peace of mind of knowing that you've done everything possible to minimize risk. So for me, James, it really, really is peace of mind. And I'm pretty sure Casper will talk a lot more around the technical benefits around having better policy frameworks. Yes. Yeah, so for me, I think you're 100% right on the peace of mind. For me, it's just the compliance to make sure you're compliant that your auditors will be happy, your IT manager or your technical team understand what's been implemented 100% all the way to your end users and especially around your remote users, Mm -hmm. your workforce working from home. That's Mm -hmm. your biggest risk at this stage. You Mm -hmm. don't have your corporate land firewalls protecting them necessarily. They're working from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And just to have that peace of mind that you understand your data, you've classified it, you know where it is, you know how it works, you know it's been segregated and it's protected. Can I actually ask you a question, just bring it closer to home? What did CypherWave do over the last couple of years with this work from home, remote work, hybrid work? Yeah, very good question. So like most companies, we had to send all of our staff off to work remotely. I think we were in a more fortunate scenario from a preparation perspective. We're an internet service provider and a cloud provider. So inside of that, we provide cloud services, connectivity, voice services. And we also own and operate a fiber to the home business called Home Connect. So when you look at it, you know, we had options to provide our employees. And for staff that were not in a fiber ready or fiber connected area, we gave them 3G devices. So this is why I say we were slightly more prepared and ready because we provide those services. We also have an ethos in our business of utilizing pretty much all of the services we offer. So when we talk about cloud, the majority of our team were already working in a VDI environment or remote desktop type environment. So for them to be able to work off site, it was almost quite similar to being in the office. Additionally, because we have firewalls deployed into our office environment, and we offer customers firewalls as a 14F partner and a 40 gate firewall reseller. We were able to allow our employees to remote connect into the office through secure connections. Mm. Casper can talk a little bit more around the cloud, the Active Directory component to protect the network as such. And then maybe around the security protocols we had in place to make sure that our employees could work securely remotely. Yes, definitely. For me personally, it's just the multiple layers of authentication that we had put in place. Just connecting to a VPN was simply not good enough. It's enabling multiple layers of authentication, ensuring every single identity on the network is verified and authenticated on multiple locations. That was very important for us. Everything else, because all the data sits with us and the devices the staff use, is just the endpoint. It doesn't have any 
data on it or anything sensitive on it, it made it simple for us to go down that route, actually without any impact to the business, purely because we have our data centralized and protected using all the technologies we've invested in Mm. to do that. I think also, Casper, the thing to mention as well is because, you know, James is probably wondering, well, what applications are you guys using in order to have a minimum data footprint at an employee's endpoint, right? So we use a lot of cloud applications with web-based interfaces Mm. on it, whether it's our CRM that we call Jarvis, it's a web-based interface, our ERP system, web-based interface hosted in our cloud with minimum desktop-based applications to be able to get to. So I spoke about the traditional security approach. We've adopted that inside of our business. So we have the firewalls, we have email security, we're a MimePass partner, so we have MimePass deployed for email security and archiving ourselves. On the backups, we're a Veeam partner, so all of our data is backup using that technology. And then when you look at endpoints, we're an ESET partner for antivirus. So we've deployed ESET on every endpoint device we have. So the principles of traditional security, we've ticked those boxes inside of our own business. And what we've had to do through COVID is also start to ask ourselves the question about how are these policies being enforced, managed from a remote workforce? And that's actually where this started, starting to question whether we're reviewing our IT policy framework because we had a lot of time. Mm. You know, two years ago, life wasn't as busy as it was because we were all trying to figure out what the then new normal was. Um, And so, of course, we saw globally that there was a movement around questioning, you know, your IT policy framework to be able to mitigate risk. And so we started looking at an adoption methodology of zero trust security framework inside of CypherWave, because that's where it started with CypherWave as a business. And then looking and saying, well, you know, when you really look at it, we provide customers connectivity, we provide them with cloud services, we're already providing them with firewalling, we're already providing them with endpoints. How are we then taking it to the next level to be able to raise awareness about some of the things that worried us as executives in the business? And that's really where we looked at it and wanted to take a very different approach to security by adopting the zero trust security model. And I think on that note, I think what you really are saying is you're a practice what you preach and your own company is an excellent example. And I think our listeners are definitely reflect on what the two of you have been saying today. So thank you. I think that the point about zero trust isn't that we don't trust each other. It's important to have that business relationship and ability to forge trusting relationships. But we should be very cautious of how we use data, how we transfer data, what devices are on the networks. And by maintaining that ethos of zero trust, it's actually a culture. And it sounds like you've inculcated that culture yourselves into your organization. And I'm sure it's contagious amongst your partners and clients as well. Absolutely, James. I mean, when I look at what we started off talking about from a zero trust perspective, it's more so around an approach and questioning. It's not really onerous because like I said, most businesses are already doing or implementing security services, applications, devices in their network. It's really about questioning, questioning the application that you have, questioning rights access management to Mm. the application. And what is your policy around users leaving? What happens to their logins? What happens to their footprint around that? You know, Casper was talking about the office network, looking at your office network and looking at what devices are being connected to the user. You know, these days, you know, employees are bringing along their devices as well. And that could be the weak point inside of your business. It's looking at your cloud infrastructure, like Casper was talking about and saying, you know, what's most notably important in cloud. And we were talking about data breaches where third party companies are accessing your services to provide you a service, but that's touching your data. You know, are you questioning that data that leaves your environment? How safe is it on their environment? You may have an amazing relationship with a supplier or a vendor or partner like CypherWave or any one of the other cloud providers, and you may have proper processes in place, but you're asking the question around the data footprint. So that's where the zero trust model comes in. You know, it's really not meant to be onerous, like I said. It really is about making businesses think a little further around what they're doing inside of their business. Yeah, especially around emails as well. Yeah. I mean, everyone runs their business from email. But should everything live in emails? 
You know, That's... should you be sending this data no. via an email? Mm -hmm. Should you be sharing this information via email? And that's where our CRM system comes in. Mm. It's allowed us to remove our dependency on email in order to run the business. Brilliant. Um, and literally. if you don't mind me saying, Casper, I think that's an excellent reminder to all of our listeners is if you run your business via email, think about the implications. Just start there. Yeah. And it's, it's been fascinating talking to the two of you, Wayne Bazaar and Casper van der Volt, the Chief Cloud Security Officer at CypherWeb. Thank you both very, very much for your time. I know that we've got a couple more podcasts lined up and it's some fascinating conversations to be had in the near future. And I certainly look forward to that. And I'm sure the rest of the Tech Central listeners will. So for me, James Erasmus at Tech Central, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, James. Cheers, Great James. chatting to you. Thank you.